So far we've been uh, looking at uh, Paul's letters uh, in terms of their structure, their form, and we've taken a close-up look at the letter opening and the Thanksgiving section. And so now we turn to the main part of the letters, uh, typically referred to as the body of, of the letter. Now it should be obvious that once we move to the body of the letter, we're in a different ball game than we are in the opening, Thanksgiving, or even the closing. Because in those other surrounding three sections, the epistolary conventions are rather fixed, uh, they're rather consistent, and thereby it's quite easy to see when there are changes given to the form or the structure. In the body, however, there are a lot of differences because obviously the content of the body of any letter is going to vary from letter to letter. What's a problem in one church will not be a problem in the other. But nevertheless, here we still can, uh, in an important way, approach uh, the body of the letter from an epistolary point of view by looking at these conventions, these stereotyped expressions that often are found in the body. And the important thing here is to not only be able to uh, name these conventions and to identify their form, but more importantly to understand their function. If we just understood their form, uh, I mean, we could kind of show off, we could go to our beloved, whoever he or she might be, and we might say something like, I know what an appeal formula is. <sighs> but that person might blow our bubble by saying, well, well, big deal, who cares? And so unless we can follow up that claim by explaining how an appeal formula functions and how that's important for understanding uh, the letters of the New Testament, we really haven't gained a lot. And so we'll spend first some time talking about the form of any convention, but then also stressing its function and the potential significance uh, that has for understanding or interpreting uh, Paul's letters. So the first uh, bunch of conventions we're looking at have in common the fact that they're all transitional, and I'll say more about that in just a second. So the first transitional formula we're looking at is typically called an appeal formula, an appeal formula. And this was examined by a Scandinavian scholar a number of years ago, and he looked at secular letters of that day, and he understood and saw many times this formula centered around the key verb parakaleo, or its synonym eratao. By the way, the appeal formula is a lot easier to see in Greek than it is in English because our English translations will use a variety of different terms to translate this verb parakaleo. So you might have in your translation, I urge you, I implore you, I beseech you. But yet, uh, in the original Greek, it's more easy to see because it's always that same key verb parakaleo, or again, its synonym eratao, to ask. So the second element that that Scandinavian scholar, whose name I try to avoid pronouncing because I don't want to butcher it, uh, noticed is you have the recipient of the appeal. And then thirdly, and he thought this was important, a prepositional phrase indicating the source of the sender's authority. So in other words, the person says, this is my status, or this is the reasons why I have the right to appeal you to do this, and also why you should indeed do it. And then, of course, the last and maybe the most important thing is the actual content of the appeal, typically introduced in Greek either by a hati clause or a hina clause. So we see this in the New Testament uh, a number of times. So if you take a very common and well-known verse, Romans 12, verse 1, we see here those same four elements. Paul says, I appeal to you, parakaleo. And then you have the recipients, you, and Paul also adds the vocative brothers, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And then notice the prepositional phrase, by the mercies of God. So Paul too is giving a prepositional phrase which gives the authority, the grounds on which he is about to give this appeal. In other words, it's the mercies of God in light of what God has done for you. This is now why you ought to do this, what I'm appealing. And then the appeal is that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And you can see there, look at all the uh, examples that I can cite in Paul's letter. So many occurrences of the appeal formula, a formula that you probably weren't aware of for your whole life, even when reading these letters. Now that we know that this thing exists, now that we know somewhat about its form, remember the more important question, the more fruitful uh, question is, uh, what is its function? What is a writer trying to gain or accomplish by using this uh, appeal formula? And it has a primary function that all of the ones we're looking have has, and that is as a paragraph marker. 
Now you might not think that's that significant because you say I have no problem finding where we ought to begin a new part in uh, Paul's writings. I just look at the paragraph breaks. Well, if you don't know already, I better remind you that the New Testament manuscripts are written in a form that we call scriptio continua, scriptio continua, translated continuous script. They just start writing in capital or unsealed letters, and they don't stop at the end of the sentence. Even if it's in the middle of a word, there is no uh, punctuation marks. There are certainly no verse divisions, no paragraph divisions, no chapter divisions, and of course no headings as we also have in most of our modern translations. So we have none of those clues by which we can uh, signal or have the author signal us the shifts or the, or the transitions in uh, the text. But that doesn't mean that the authors didn't leave clues, they just left, diff left different kinds of clues. They left literary clues, and since we're dealing with letters, a lot of those literary clues can be more narrowly identified as epistolary clues. And one of the, f the big clues for indicating transition, then, is the appeal formula. Now, there's a secondary function that's very important, too. Um, the Scandinavian scholar Bjerkeland, uh, I've tried to avoid his name, but I just said it, uh, he observed something interesting about the appeal formula. He said, when he looked at secular letters of that day, he said that when a ruler or king or government official were writing to an audience that was friendly, that they had a good relationship with, and thereby the writer could be optimistic that the people would do what he or she would say, then they wouldn't be heavy-handed and say, I command you. They would use the softer, more gentle, I parakaleo, I appeal to you, or I ask you. I have an image here uh, because we have that expression about putting a gun to somebody's head. And, and sometimes we can be heavy-handed. If I went to a, a seminary student and I metaphorically put a gun to their head and say, now, as a professor here at Calvin Theological Seminary who has the authority to flunk you and ruin your call to ministry, I command, now, that would be very, very heavy-handed, wouldn't it? Instead, uh, I'm assuming you and I have a good relationship. You want to do uh, well at seminary, and so there's no need for me to be heavy-handed and say, I command you. Instead, I use the softer, more gentle, I appeal to you. Maybe an analogy would be helpful here. Uh, Sears, their marketing people told them a few years ago that when people heard the word Sears, especially women, they thought of, toy, uh, of uh, tools, of, of machinery. And so they started this ad campaign that maybe you remember. It was called the softer side of Sears. And so the appeal formula is the softer side of Paul or any other biblical writer who uses this formula. So one, it marks transition, and two, it expresses a more friendly or less heavy-handed tone. Now, you may wonder whether Paul actually knows of this difference, and he does. Uh, because in Philemon, we see how he puts these two connotations side by side, back to back. Notice how he begins the body of the letter of Philemon, this very short and carefully crafted letter, as we've seen already in a number of examples. Paul says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and command you to do what you ought to do, more because of love I appeal. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ, I appeal to you concerning my child to whom I gave birth in prison, Onesimus. So two things here. I know that the body of the letter begins. I know that the Thanksgiving section is ended and the body is beginning because Paul has signaled that with not just one, but two occurrences of the appeal formula. And what's more, Paul has used the softer, more user-friendly appeal instead of the heavy-handed command. Although if you think about it, you can see that Paul is actually quite clever and strategic in mentioning that he could command. Because you should say to yourself, why does Paul even mention that he could do this? Why doesn't he just start the letter instead one half or verse later? Why doesn't he just start off by saying, I appeal to you because of love, I appeal to you? Why does Paul spell out that he could be bold and command you to do what you ought to do? You see, that's not a very subtle technique of Paul of kind of laying down his authority. This is what he could do. It makes Philemon think, oh, this is an option which could happen, and thereby puts extra pressure on Philemon to do what Paul is supposedly not commanding, but instead appealing him to do. Well, that's the first of the transitional formulas we're looking at, the appeal formula. We're going to skip the example of uh, idleness and go on to the second formula, the disclosure formula.
Now I grant you that this name is not a very happy one. You can see that this scholar wrote an article using that name and it's stuck ever since. I think the logic was that the speaker is disclosing information and therefore the word disclosure uh, became attached to this formula. A better way to think of it though is it's a formula, a relatively fixed phrase, that centers on the verb to know, to know. And it occurs in a variety of forms. You can get a positive form where the biblical writer says, I want you to know that. Or it can be stated negatively, I do not want you not to know that. Although, again, the Greek is more clear than the English because no English translation will ever have those double negatives. They won't say, I do not want you not to know. They'll say instead, I do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed. And so again, the reason we look at the text in the original language is not just for the grammatical element in our hermeneutic, but it helps us to see and appreciate the literary features in a more obvious way. And there are other forms that this formula occurs in. It can be stated abbreviated, we know that such and such is the case. There can be an imperative command form, know that such and such is the case. A motivation for writing, I am writing to you so that you may know. But the key idea is that the central verb, the main verb that introduces this phrase is the verb to know. So that's what it looks like in terms of its form. The next question is, what function does it have? And again, it has first a transitional function. You can see, in fact, there that five of the major transitions in Paul's letters from the thanksgiving section to the body of the letter, Paul signals that with the use of the disclosure formula. But it can occur in any place in the body of the letter and thereby can mark transition at any point in the body. Now, in addition to marking transition, though, this disclosure formula can also uh, express or signal degrees of pleasure or displeasure that Paul has with his audience. So, for example, in the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians, ten times Paul asks them a question, Do you not know? And again, the verb know is the key part. And I might also remind you that questions in Greek can either be a neutral question, in which the speaker doesn't know the answer. So if I said, are you enjoying this video? I have no way of knowing whether the answer is yes or no, and I've, I've, I've kind of structured my question so that it's ambiguous. Or I could have a rhetorical question in which I'm asserting something. I could say, you're not enjoying today's video, are you? I'm clearly expecting the answer no. Or I say, you're enjoying today's video, aren't you? So by changing the word order and in tone in English, we can signal whether we expect the answer yes or no. Well, in Greek, you can signal the same thing by whether or not you introduce the question with the negative either ou or the negative me. If you ask a question uh, introducing, uh, if you introduce a question with a negative ou, the speaker expects the answer yes, and if you introduce a question with the negative me, then the speaker is clearly uh, anticipating the answer no. So ten times now Paul goes in the first six chapters to the Corinthians and says, do you not know? And he asks these questions always with ooh. In other words, he says the answer is yes. Yes, you do know this. If I said to you ten times, you know, within one class period, don't you know this, and don't you know this, and you know this, don't you? You would slink in your seat because you would rightly perceive that I'm not happy with you, right? I, I'm kind of disappointed or even frustrated that you don't know this because you should know this. We've gone over it before. Why do I have to remind you of what you already know? And so the tenfold occurrence of this form of the disclosure formula is one of the clues, there are others too, it's one of the clues that there is a growing tension between Paul and the Corinthian church. Well, in addition to expressing uh, displeasure, it can also exp express pleasure. This is a, it takes a little bit to kind of set up um, so you appreciate the shift what's happening here. So before I get to 4.13, I want to backtrack to the passage just before it, which happens to be chapter 4, 1 to 12. So this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12. And there are four occasions in that earlier passage, 4, 1 to 12, where Paul signals to his readers that they should know this already because he had already taught them this. In colloquial terms, Paul is kind of saying, been there and done that. Or maybe to use a different phrase, this is previously shared material, right? This is stuff that I, Paul, went over with you before, and so you should know better. So, for instance, in 4.1, he says, as you 
received past tense from us. When did, when did the Thessalonians receive this instruction about how they should walk in a way that pleases God? Well, when Paul was with them on his first missionary journey for three plus Sabbaths. Or in the next verse, right? You know what commands we gave you. When did Paul give them these commands? Well, earlier when he was there on his second missionary journey, the first time he was there and founded or established the church. And then when he gets into chapter 4, 3 to 8, and talks about holiness in sexual conduct, he says, as we previously told you and testified to you. So two references to the fact that Paul apparently had talked about these kind of things, that they ought to be holy in their sexual conduct. They shouldn't follow their former pagan ways in terms of how they act out sexually, but they ought to follow the characteristic and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then the last part of that discussion as he talks about brotherly and sisterly love and some in the Thessalonian church who are taking advantage of that love by being idle, lazy, sponging off of the generosity of fellow believers. So Paul says, you know, you have to work. And then he says, 411, as we commanded you. Right? When did he command them this? Well, he must have commanded them that again during his first visit, the founding of the church. So in 4, 1 to 12, we have these four not very subtle references by Paul, where Paul is, I won't say he's angry, but he's, he's kind of saying, you guys should know better, right? We've been there and done that already, or this is previously shared material. And then when we have next then, 4.13, so the next verse, the, the introduction to the next major unit is, but we do not want you not to know. Now hopefully bells start ringing in your head as soon as you hear the verb to know, Although some translations will say, we do not want you to be ignorant. We do not want you to be uninformed. But the Greek is quite clear. We do not want you not to know. And you're saying disclosure formula. And also you're saying, oh, this must be a shift where Paul is signaling a change to a new topic. But then hopefully you also notice that this form of it, we do not want you not to know, suggests that Paul is now going to talk to them about something he had never talked to them about before. He had talked to them in the previous passage about holiness and sexual conduct and brotherly and sisterly love and work in that kind of context. But he said, I never ever discussed with you what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes again. And so Paul's rebuke in this paragraph isn't very strong at all. In fact, he's not really rebuking them. He's comforting them as the concluding verse for verse 18 clearly makes known. Okay, so the takeaway is not only knowing the form of the disclosure formula, but knowing its function, its first function, namely as a marker of transition, its secondary function, indicating degrees of pleasure or displeasure that Paul has with his audience. We go to a third transitional formula, the, the now about or but concerning formula. Those are English translations because the Greek is a fixed expression. It's peri de. Peri de. And it's usually the very first thing in the sentence because peri is a preposition and then de is, in technical language, always in the post positive position. That is the second, second element in the sentence. And again, its primary function then is to introduce a new section or a new topic. The best example of the significance of the peri de section can be found in first. Corinthians. And I invite you just to pull your Bibles open for a second or maybe do it online. Maybe you can't because you're already using your computer for watching this video. But the second half of 1 Corinthians can be clearly outlined on the basis of these peri de sections. So you should turn first of all to chapter 7 verse 1. Chapter 7 verse 1. And we read, and that's an important verse, Paul says, now about, and again your translation may have it differently, but in Greek it's peride, now about the things you wrote. You see, before Paul wrote to the Corinthians, they wrote to him. And they had a series of questions or topics that they wanted to address. And they introduced all of these topics with the phrase, peri de, now about. And so one of the topics that they must have talked about in their letter, and the first thing that Paul talks about in response to their request is, uh, you can see that in one, uh, chapter 7, 1 to 24, uh, what about married people? Right? And uh, should they have sex together or should they be apart? And if so, for how long? Right? That was a question they were struggling with. And what about widows? Should they stay that way or should they get married or what? 
And then they must add another question related to this, because 725, it begins by saying, Paul says now, now about virgins or betrothed daughters or something like that. Okay, should they remain single or should they get married? And, and so Paul answers that question that the Corinthians were asking about. Then we jump to 8 verse 1 and Paul says, now about meat offered to idols. This is a huge problem in the ancient world, how there was a temptation to go to a pagan temple and offer a sacrifice, and then only some of the meat would be sacrificed. Most of the meat would be eaten, often in a temple. And so this food is not just a, uh, this meal then uh, is not just a regular meal, but it has a, a cultic connotation, has a religious connotation. And, and it must have been a big problem because Paul deals with it not just in chapter 8, not just in chapter 9, not just in chapter 10, but even one verse from chapter 11, a long section. Now in 11.2, Paul uses a different formula to introduce a new topic, the same formula he uses to introduce 11.17, but if you go ahead to chapter 12 instead, chapter 12, verse 1, you find your next peri de or now about section. There you read, now about spiritual gifts or spiritual people. And this too must have been a big problem because it's taken up in all of chapter 12, all of chapter 13, and all of 14. Chapter 15, Paul uses a different formula for whatever reason to introduce that subject. What if I told you the Greek in 15.1 could be rendered, now I want you to know that. And again, hopefully the bells would be ringing. You'd be saying, aha, another example of a disclosure formula. And Paul introduces uh, the topic of the resurrection, chapter 15, with that disclosure formula. But the next peri death formula occurs in 16.1, now about the contribution or the collection for the saints. Uh, don't confuse this with an earlier offering that the Antiochian church made and Paul and Barnabas delivered. This is later in Paul's life during his third missionary journey where he is, if I might say, hitting upon all upon his Gentile churches to, to give an offering, a collection that he was pulling together, and he ultimately delivered at the end of the third missionary journey to the needy Christians in Palestine. And then finally, the last uh, peri death section is 1612, where Paul says, now about Apollos. So the point being, the peri death formula is an important formula which explains to a large degree the whole second half, or the structure of the second half of 1 Corinthians. The last uh, transitional formula that we're going to look at is the vocative. And for Paul, it usually is Adelphoi, brothers, or as many translations increasingly have it, brothers and sisters. And this is a transitionary device, as the other ones are too, that are used not just by Paul, but by other New Testament writers too. And so James, when we get to that letter, we'll see he also uses brothers, the vocative, as a transitionary device. John uses the vocative, but a different term. Instead of brothers, he uses children, or my dear children. And you can always see the vocative, even in English, because it's bracketed in the sentence by a comma. So if it's in the middle of a sentence, it has a comma both before and after the word. And if it's the first word in the sentence, obviously it'll only have a comma after the word. But even in English, it should be relatively easy to identify this vocative, this transitional device. And it marks not only a transition to a major unit, but also potentially to a minor or what I might call a subunit. Now, before we bring this uh, discussion of transitional uh, uh, devices to a close, I want to illustrate how differently we might read now a part of Scripture in light of these things. So if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. So again, take a minute, because I think only if you see it visually will you appreciate uh, how much you've learned to read a letter as a letter. So if you got it, all right, if you don't, pause the tape for a minute and make sure you're all set up. And um, I'm going to look down once in a while. I kind of know this by heart, but once in a while I'll refer to verses, and, and I'm hoping you're going to see the same things that I'm going to see. So I'm expecting to see, now that I know how to read a letter as a letter, I'm expecting it, obviously, to have a letter opening, and the first of three things in the letter opening is the sender. And so I'm expecting to find Paul, 
maybe some close enders, and I do, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Although it's a bit unusual, there's no title. This is, an, this is kind of early in Paul's life, and it reflects the fact that he has a good relationship with the Thessalonian church, and there's no need for him to assert or reassert or reaffirm his apostolic status. The second thing I expect to find in every letter opening is a recipient formula to the church of so-and-so. And, and that's what we find here, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the third thing I expect to see is Paul metaphorically putting his hands up and blessing them, saying grace and peace, that inclusive greeting that we talked about earlier, and, and we find that here too. The next thing I expect to find is a thanksgiving section. It's going to begin either Eucharisto, I give thanks in the singular, or Eucharistumen, we give thanks. And, and it's the plural that we find here, so I know it begins in 1 verse 2. We always thank God. And then we expect to find, not going to take time to, to find the four or five different parts of a Thanksgiving section. And I know that it ends at verse 10. Why? Because it reaches that eschatological climax that we talked about in the Thanksgiving section. In other words, a reference to the end times, which kind of builds to a high point, a natural point where this section of the letter would come to an end. And so in verse 10, we read about how you are waiting for his son from heaven. That's a clear reference to the second coming, the parousia, the return of Jesus. And also the last part of the verse, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So the wrath is coming, it's in the future, it's going to take place on the judgment day when Jesus Christ returns. And I know that the Thanksgiving section ends at verse 10, chapter 1, not only from that fact, but from the fact that 2-1 has clear markers of the beginning of the body of the letter. Notice how it starts, 2-1, you know... And again, hopefully the bells are ringing. You say, aha, disclosure formula. And you see here, brothers and brothers and sisters in my translation. You see the vocative, another transitional marker indicating the beginning of the body of the letter. Jump over to chapter 2, verse 17. That's the beginning of another new section. And we see, but brothers or brothers and sisters. Again, the vocative marking the shift to a new section. Go to chapter 4, verse 1 for a moment. And this is going to be clear in Greek and in some more literal translations because the NIV has uh, taken a long sentence and restructured things. But in Greek, there are two verbs found right off the bat that go something like this. We ask and urge you. And ask and urge are the eritao, the synonym, and urge is the Greek parakaleo. And so this time the bells are ringing, but not saying disclosure formula, but hopefully appeal formula. Maybe some of your translation might say, finally. Maybe you remember from the dictionary article that was assigned. That's another marker of transition. We also see here um, verse 2, for you know what instructions we gave you. And again, now we have that disclosure formula marking the beginning of a new section. Go down further to chapter 4, verse 9. And you hopefully will see in your Bibles, now about, or but concerning Philadelphia, brotherly and sisterly love. Oh, there's that peri -death formula. Go to 4.13, and there are three clues here, two which are obvious, and the third one which is a little more hidden. But I see in my translation, brothers and brothers and sisters. So we have the vocative again. We do not want you to be uninformed. Literally, we do not want you not to know disclosure formula. And you can't see it so clearly in English, but it's there. And that, what if I said to you, about those who sleep? There's a peri de here, except instead of being at the very beginning of the sentence, it's pushed back a little bit because Paul inserted instead the disclosure formula before it. Go to 5.1. I see now about times and seasons. Here's yet the third in a row of the peri de formulas. Introducing a new topic. I also see the vocative brothers, brothers and sisters. And in verse 2, for you know, in fact you know very well, a disclosure formula. Jump down to 5.12, another introduction to a major section. Now we ask, a synonym for we appeal or urge. There's the, the appeal formula. And also the vocative, brothers and sisters. And I'm coming to the end of the letter, and I know where the end of the letter uh, begins, because I'm, I'm looking for, well, remember, 
the opening of the letter, the opening greeting is grace and peace, and then it's inverted in a chiastic way, and so the reverse order is found in the closing. You have then first the peace, a bunch of other things, and then finally the grace. Or you might know this from the uh, cl article on closings that you of mine that you read. The first element typically in a Pauline letter closing is the peace wish. And so I can see that there. I know it begins in, in chapter 5, verse 23. And again, in, if you read that article, you'll know that here Paul has skillfully expanded the peace benediction to add the themes of the second coming, a big theme in the letter, Paul comforting them with regard to the topic of the end times, and also an added emphasis on being holy or sanctified, being blameless, the, uh, another theme found in the body of the letter. So, and, and there's also some other things in the closing too, about greeting each other and greeting each other with the holy smooch or the holy kiss and what that might mean. And you might see in the words, I charge you, verse 27, where Paul has taken over the pen from the secretary or the amanuensis and he has a closing autograph, which he then writes with the final command, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers or the brothers and sisters. And also then finally the grace benediction as the letter comes to a close. So what I hope you're beginning to see is really how helpful this approach is and how differently you can read now this letter that we just looked at in light of knowing the structure, the form, and the potential significance of that for interpretation. So we'll take a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll look yet then at additional epistolary items found typically in the body of Paul's letters.